community-based food safety educators on the ground and Kimberly Rakes, who's my co-presenter today, is someone who's gone through been part of that food safety educator training. Um, so my name is Lindsay Gilmore. I'm, I've been a food safety educator now since about 2010 and uh, kind of an accidental food safety educator. I, I didn't come to this as a career. I came to it because I wanted to help small scale farmers um, find new markets and food safety became a, a more and more of a barrier to that. So educating them, getting them to feel more comfortable with what it means to comply with food safety regulations and, and so on. Uh, but we're really focusing on this, this new project on um, working with urban farmers, working with very small scale farmers who may not actually have to comply, but really do need to know about food safety. Food safety is still very important, obviously, because we don't wanna make anyone sick. And uh, I'm a chef by trade. I've had to learn about food safety in the kitchen and, and food preparation and, and storage and so on. So um, while I absolutely believe in the power of microorganisms to keep us healthy and, keep our, and, and that we need to respect microorganisms in our environment, um, it's also really important to understand that there are some microorganisms that will make us sick and, and, and can make us very sick and even kill us. So we just need to know how to reduce the risk of that. So um, Kimberly, do you wanna introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Kimberly Rakes. I am the farm manager for White Lock Community Farm. Uh, I've been working with Lindsay here for a little while now and learning how to uh, maneuver the food safety. Um, I'm also sit on the board for Future Harvest uh, CASA and I've been through the entire uh, process, of course, with Future Harvest. Um, and then I worked as an intern for the Greener Garden. And like I said, I'm at White Lock now and I'm learning a lot about uh, food safety with Lindsay. Thanks, Kimberly. Next slide, please, Sonia. So um, as I said, we are um, Chesapeake Harvest community-based produce safety educator team. Um, that includes Kimberly and myself, also Aaliyah Fraser, who unfortunately is not able to be with us today. She's a project manager and another food safety educator, but she's not feeling very well. And also Dana Barnes and Crystal Foreman. You will see them in the video that we're going to show today. Uh, and Crystal may be on, may be on later. Um, we're also, we're going to be um, showing video that we shot at Filbert Street Community Garden in Baltimore and um, Miss Rodette Jones is the garden manager there. So we're very, very grateful for Rodette um, hosting us at the farm with our cameras and our microphones and, and taking the time to talk to us in the middle of the pandemic. Next slide, please. Next slide. Thank you. So today we're going to talk about what it is to do a food safety risk assessment on your farm where you look at land use, you look at wildlife, livestock and pets. We're going to focus on animals, land use, the history of your land, how you're using it now, the animals of various different kinds, the critters, and also if you are using raw manure or manure based compost, what that means for food safety. And uh, we're going to just very quickly look at what's meant by science-based composting method. Future Harvest did a whole uh, webinar on the skillful use of, of manure and compost that you can find on their website. So we're not gonna go into a lot of detail on that. Uh, and a little bit on the records, if you have to comply with the food safety um, rule, the rec or you, have to, or you wanna get GAP certified, there are some records that you have to keep. If you're not subject to the rule and you don't not looking to be GAP certified, you don't have to keep any records, but there may be some that you want to keep just for best practices. And then we're going to talk a bit about how to reduce the risk of contamination, the importance, it's very important to assess risks before you plant and before you harvest. And uh, yeah, so, and then there are some records to keep when you use manure on the fields, again, if you have to comply. So one of the first things we'd like you to do is write in the chat, do you know if you have to comply with the produce safety rule, if you're a farmer, do you know if you have to comply with the, with the Food Safety Modernization Act produce safety rule? You could say yes, you could say no. If you know that you're qualified exempt, you could say I'm qualified exempt. 
And if you don't know, you could say you don't know. And that just gives us a little bit of an idea of who's on, on the, in the webinar today. Probably, <laughs> it's good. Don't know, don't know, don't know. Okay. So for those of you who don't know, I'm not gonna go into detail about whether or not you have to comply with your, what the actual term that's used is if you're covered by the regulation. Uh, we do have a webinar that we did in 2019 that talks about it. Um, it, we could also, if people are really interested, and you could put this in the chat or in the survey that we're going to send. I think the survey, well, you could put it in the chat if you would like us to do a short webinar on helping you understand whether you have to comply with the rule, because that is something we could do. And it's also something that's really great for our community based educator trainees to learn as well. Yeah, next slide. Okay, we're going to jump into our the first section of our video at Filbert Street Community Garden. So Sonia's gonna get that going. Street Garden with Miss Rodette Jones. Miss Rodette, could you give us a little background about yourself? Yes, my name is Rodette Jones. I am the manager of Philbert Street Garden. I have been doing the garden manager position for 10 years. I started gardening because I wanted some therapeutic relief from my stressful job that I had. And I feel as though putting my hands in the soil was the way to do it, as well as getting a nutritious, organic diet for myself. I started farming because I seen it was a need to have nutritious fruits and vegetables and an urban food desert. What keeps you farming? Um, helping the people out is uh, what keeps me farming. I like planning stuff. I like seeing the um, production process. I like seeing the, the vegetables flourish after we put them in the ground and it brings a smile to my face. And the big part is um, providing nutritious uh, vegetables to the community and also to our farm stands. Were there any changes that took place during the pandemic? During the pandemic, it was a scarce of fresh fruits and vegetables at the grocery store. So people came here to grow their own fruits and vegetables, which gave them the encouragement that they could come take these fruits and vegetables home and have their nutritious diet supplemented with foods that are organically grown at Phillips Street Garden. As food safety educators, we know every farm is different and every farmer benefits from getting one-on-one -on -one attention to help them think through the specific conditions at their farm. Whether it's educating them about produce safety, help with writing a food safety plan, design suggestions for a new wash pack shed, or understanding the produce safety rule. We begin by going to their farm to conduct a food safety risk assessment. The risk assessment helps them in several ways. It activates their food safety radar and helps them to see their property and operations through a food safety lens. It helps them identify where they need to focus their limited time and money, what they can do quickly and easily, and where they can make improvements over time. And it shows where we can continue to be helpful by providing them with targeted information and training. Today at Philbert Street Garden, we are going to walk and talk about the history of the land being farmed, the area surrounding this land, and what is raised and grown right here. As we walk and talk, we will keep our eyes open for different food safety risks that may be present and how those risks could be reduced.
Lindsay, you're on mute. Yeah, right. I started chatting away. Um, Kimberly, this is a good moment for us to say that if you are interested in having a food safety risk assessment done at your farm, you can be in contact with us. We'll put our contact information in the chat. It'd probably better if we do it at the end. Right. Um, Rodette is here. She missed herself in that, but she'll see more of herself. Okay, so what is a food safety risk assessment? Um, so I'm just gonna quote what it says here. Risk assessment is the process of paying attention to your farming operations and checking to see if there are possible food safety hazards and how likely, how seriously that hazard could, is it, how likely is it that hazard could harm somebody? And then a food safety hazard is any source of contamination on food that may cause harm to someone eating it. Next slide. And most of you at this point have probably heard of GAPS, Good Agricultural Practices. Um, these are principles and, and procedures you use to identify and reduce the risks of crop contamination. And it's all about being proactive so you can reduce any harm that might happen later on. Right? So you're assessing the risks on your farm and you're thinking about ways to reduce those risks and you wanna really think about prevention so you don't have to try and correct problems after they've happened. But there are, there are corrective actions you can take and we'll talk about those later. Next slide. So on the farm, contamination can come from many different sources and every farm has water and people working there, soil, equipment, animals, all of these things can, they're all important, they're all necessary and they can also be a source of contamination. Next slide. And there are three different sources of contamination that are talked about in food safety, biological, chemical and physical. Biological typically um, are the most common contaminants and, um, you, but you still need to look for all of these different things and think about the ways that they can be getting on, contaminating the food. Next slide. And you need to think about what are the, where, which crops are the most vulnerable. So um, this slide gives you an idea of the closer something is to the ground, the more likely it is to be contaminated from, particularly from biological contaminants. Um, and also crops that are eaten raw because they don't go through the kill step, as it's called, of cooking. They're not pasteurized. They're not cooked. Um, they are also much more likely to make someone sick if they're contaminated. Next step. I mean, next slide. <laughs> so you start by thinking about what was your land used for before you started to grow crops on it? So what happened in the last five years? And in these examples... Um, the chicken trailer and the composting toilet, they may be, if, if you started growing crops on a piece of land that previously had a chicken trailer or a composting toilet, there may be biological contaminants from raw manure in, on the ground or in the soil still. And then the junk piles that are very common on farms and very often in an urban setting um, with vacant lots, it starts out having a lot of trash and debris that needs to be removed. And so you have to think about what physical contaminants could still be there, such as broken plastic, wood, metal, or glass. And there may also be chemical contaminants. Um, oftentimes with an, an urban setting, you need to do soil testing to make sure you don't have chemical contaminants in the soil that either need to be remediated or you, you don't actually uh, plant in the soil, you do, um, you, uh, cover the soil and, and grow above soil. Next slide. Then there's next door and uphill. Um, in this, in these particular, I'm, I'm showing some pretty extreme examples in some case, just to get the idea across. So in this case, there are fuel tanks set up. There was actually a strawberry field right next to those fuel tanks, really close to it. And so there was no particular procedure in place if there was a, a fuel spill. So you wanna make sure that if you have any kind of chemical, chemical um, storage that you're thinking through where it's placed and what to do if you have a spill. And then this is a particularly terrible example of manure runoff, just to give you the idea. But actually, I, sometimes I come across farms uh, where there's a barn with animals and it's uphill from a field 
And when, the, when it rains, all the manure from the barn just flows down into the field. And there was one particular farmer that I visited with when we did a risk assessment. And what he ended up doing was digging a diversion ditch to, so that when it rained, the, um, the manure and the water and manure would flow off away from the, the crops below it. And then if there are woods around, um, obviously there's gonna be a, maybe more of a presence of wildlife, although there's always wildlife. And it's a good idea to, before you start planting, if, you, if you're new to the land, to, to look at the wildlife traffic, what are, what are their pathways? And think about how you could work around those because they're less likely to change their pathways unless you put in fencing. And, but it's also possible that woods may provide food and habitat for critters that might otherwise want to feast on your lettuce. Then um, they certainly provide habitat for predators and the predators might help to keep down the, the um, critters that like to eat vegetables. So that's another thing. It's not a bad thing to have woods. It's, it's actually a very good thing. But uh, you just have to balance. Do I need to have deer fencing because there's a lot of deer coming through and so on. Next slide. So today we're, really, we're going to focus on the risks from having animals alongside crops, pets, life, wildlife. Uh, there's always wildlife, as I said, even in the city, and uh, Kimberly can attest to that. We often have conversations about wildlife, and sometimes it's people, sometimes it's children. It's any, any critter that it's hard for you to control, basically. Next slide. And we're also going to talk about how to safely treat, store, and apply soil amendments such as raw manure and compost that contains manure. All right, so we're going to go to the next video section. And then Kimberly's going to take us away with talking about critters. So tell us about Filbert Street Garden. So Filbert Street Garden has been here for 10 years. It's an adopted lot through the city of Baltimore. And we are currently in the process of getting a deed from the land from the Department of Public Works. Before Filbert Street Garden became a farm, it was a vacant lot that they had to clean before they made it a farm. Ms. Rada, can you give us some information about what is surrounding Filbert Street Garden? So we have a water tower that's been uh, constructed here for over a century or almost a half a century old um, by the city of Baltimore. We also have adjacent to that the Curtis Bay Elementary School which the kids come over and do garden workshops here, right here in the garden. We also have residential all the way surround us on the other sides. And we have a coal mine, which is interesting at the bottom of the hill with tr a lot of truck traffic. Philby Street Garden is raising sheep. We have two sheep. We have two turkeys. We have ducks. We have chickens, we have billy goats, and we have bees on the farm. So can you tell us about the crops that are being grown here at, at Philbert Street Garden? A lettuce in the hoop house. We have cauliflower in the hoop house. We have kale in the hoop house. We also had zucchini and squash growing in the outer garden. Also, we have pumpkins growing. Uh, kale and collard greens on the outside. We have strawberries, we have okra, we had uh, tomatoes growing. So it's just an array of um, vegetables that we have growing at Filbert Street Garden. Do you use any animal manure here at Filbert Street Garden? Of course, we have chicken manure readily used for our garden soil. So what we do is take in the chicken manure that we get from the chicken coop we take and mix it with compost or regular soil to enrich our plants. Very interesting you say that too. And we also use the, the manure from the ducks pond that we have over here. We use that to establish the roots of the plants. So we use that water to establish the seedlings of our newly developed seedling plants. What can you tell us about the compost that is being produced here at Filbert Street Garden? The Baltimore Compost Collective Project 
is host by Silver Street Garden. It's a residential compost pickup project, which they pick up compost from South Baltimore residents. They bring it back here and they process the food scraps into compost. The compost is produced here at the garden for our local gardeners. Welcome back, everybody. <laughs> um, I'm Kimberly, as Lindsay said, and we'll be talking about the wildlife, the livestock, and working animals and pets that you may have on your property. We call them critters, and there's always animals on the farm. Most of them we welcome. Some of them are harder to appreciate. First that we have to keep in mind is to limit their access to the field. What are the hazards? Since we share the farm with critters, of one sort or another, we need to think through the possibilities of food safety hazards from raising crops alongside as well as all the property adjacent. Consider wildlife patterns, animal population, the topography, your animal access, water source, and fecal contamination in work or production areas. Farm location may always vary along with federal, state, and county laws regarding wildlife. Always use effective and legal practices. Next slide, please. There are bacteria and parasites in animal poop and bodily fluids that can make people sick. And there are plant pathogens that can cause disease in your crops as well. Next slide, please. What are the hazards in the word poop? <laughs> Type it in the chat box if you could, just to have us uh, generate a little conversation about what type of hazards to see if everybody is aware. Animal poop is the most common source of human pathogens. E. coli, thank you. Salmonella. Any others? Okay, there we go. <laughs> Thank you. Next slide, please. So our bodily fluids such as urine, blood and saliva and bedding saturated with any of these, as well as feathers and hides. Blood injuries should be logged on the farm and it should be have an SOP that attached, that should be near your, uh, your uh, log so that everyone knows what they need to do in the, in the case of an incident. Make sure your first aid kit and everything is in that same area and along with the supplies so that all of your staff are familiar with where to find everything when they, uh, if someone does have an injury. The other important thing you need to keep in mind is having a location where all of these things take place. If someone is sick, there should be a designated area uh, for everyone. And that's right, with the SOPs, with your standard operating procedures, it should tell everybody what should happen if someone is sick if someone cuts themselves, um, if you're observing your farm and you notice that there is, uh, as we said, bedding mashed down where maybe cats and things have been sleeping, you can also be very mindful because you can use your nose and you'll be able to smell things. So it helps to, to do more than one when you're walking around your farm. Next slide, please. So you have to access the rest. Think about all of the ways that poop and bodily fluids might spread from one surface to another through cross-contamination. Handling it, stepping in it, driving through it, getting, on, getting it on your clothes or your shoes, 
getting it in the water, and then cross-contamination produce and food on contact surfaces. Next slide, please. Are you paying attention when you move from working around animals and manure to working with produce? If you have contact with animals, wash your hands regularly. Brushing off obvious dirt, manure, or blood is not enough to remove bacteria and germs. What other practices are you currently using to control cross-contamination? If you could put that in the chat box for me, please. Or if you'd like, you can unmute yourself if you'd like to say what other uh, avenues that you are using to keep from cross-contamination. A few of the farms that we went to, and you'll see a slide of it in a little while, they uh, have extra clothing. I keep extra clothing on our farm and extra shoes. So it's especially in the, when the weather breaks and we start having our interns and volunteers again, be mindful of that. And you may ask folks to bring a separate pair of shoe or uh, boots, especially if you are uh, tending to livestock. Next slide, please. Are you washing your hands correctly after working with animals? When we say correctly, um, it's supposed to be at least how many um, seconds should you be washing your hands? You should also be washing your hands in the front as well as the back in between your fingers, your nails um, and your wrist. So it's a little bit more, yep, saying happy birthday. <laughs> it's a little bit more than just putting a little soap on your hands and putting your hands under the water. It is a very intense um, washing of your hands, the backs of your hands, as well as, like I said, your nails and your wrists. Next slide, please. Is it easy for people to wash their hands before they work with produce? Make sure it is easy for them to locate where your wash station is. Do you have convenient hand washing stations using portable water and stocked with soap, paper towels, and a trash can with a lid on it to dispose of your paper towels? Nothing fancy or expensive, but effective, efficient, sustainable, and maintainable for your farm. Set a plan and implement that plan. Next slide, please. Are you protecting your hands, clothes, and footwear, or do you have dedicated equipment, clothing, and shoes, or boots for when you handle animals or manure? The picture in the middle is uh, one of the farms that we went to, and I really appreciated the way that they uh, changed their shoes and that the, the simple, the simplistic way that they have this, because it also makes it easy for you to wash all the boots down at the same time. So this was a really uh, excellent example of really keeping you know, things clean and protecting your clothes as well as your shoes. And you see the apron, that's another thing we do have at White Lock. Um, so it is helpful. And that way you can keep things from getting uh, contaminated and you can remove your outer layer and then have on another layer then. Next slide, please. Where and how are you storing protective clothes and shoes? Are you inviting cross-contamination? You can see on that, <laughs> that is, this is, you can see from that picture there, um, everything is there. There's food particles, that's lettuces down on the floor. There's uh, the boots, all of the dirt, clothing. Um, hopefully your area where you are on your farm does not look like that. And if it does, let's get it cleaned up. Cause we're not, we're not gonna tell you which farm this was, but we did visit. <laughs> And we surreptitiously took this photograph. <laughs> Next slide, please. And as you can see here, everything is nice and neat, uh, tidy. <laughs> Are you reducing the risk of con cross contamination? There's the extra clothing all nice hung up so that they can change in and out of things. 
the, of course, the boots, as we saw on the other photo, um, placed upside down so that they can be washed on the, on the heels. Next slide, please. You're muted. Sorry, yep. Yep. I'm sorry. <laughs> if you can't change your your footwear, you could set up a wet or dry sanitize, sanitizing foot bath. You'll notice um, the mat that's here in front of you. There's water and I'm sure there's a sanitizer inside as well, mixed with the water and they're using, just stepping inside of it and cleaning the bottoms of their shoes off. Next slide, please. Are you sharing barn yards, walkways, and driving lanes with the livestock? Wheels, clothing, feet, and water splashed from the puddles can all be a source of contamination if you are not thoughtful. If there is a risk of walking or driving through raw manure, is there a way to avoid this or check for contamination of equipment, wheels, or feet and clean them before handling food? Next slide, please. Do you have dedicated, do you have dedicated equipment for working with animals and manure? Or are you sharing equipment between produce and livestock operations? If there is sharing equipment, are you cleaning and sanitizing between each use? Next slide, please. Can wild or domesticated animals cause contamination problems with the sources of water you use for irrigation or cleaning? Or can you fence them off or discourage them? Next slide, please. At the PEC Community Farm in Loudoun County, Virginia, they have a stream that runs through cattle pastures that they wanted to use for irrigation. They wanted to improve the quality of the water, so they fenced off the stream to keep the cattle out and created a riparian buffer. Riparian buffers are the grasses, shrubs, trees, and other vegetation growing along stream. These plants control erosion and help filter and keep water clean. You can see from this photo the difference this has made at the level of organic matter in the stream. You can notice the picture that was taken in 2014, it's quite cloudy. And in 2018 with the changes and creating that uh, riparian barrier, the water is a whole lot cleaner. Next slide, please. Hey, Kimberly, I just wanted to add, you know, it, in that riparian barrier, there are lots of birds, there's lots of lo wildlife habitat, and yet that stream is a lot cleaner because of the fencing and the riparian barrier. So it's a really good example of how you can have lots of wildlife habitat and still have uh, much cleaner water because of the habitat. Next slide, please. Those of you who do have livestock, if you could type in the chat, what barriers do you have in place to keep animals and, and crops separated? Anything innovative that anyone has, anything new that you've come up with? Um, and feel free to unmute yourself if you like, if you wanted to explain to us something new and innovative that you've done. Or if, if we're in the chat, oh, fences, okay. Fencing. Now, are you using deer fencing? Uh, what type of fencing are you referring to? Anybody? Deer fencing. Deer fencing, okay. Thank you. Next slide, please.
If pets follow you into the fields, can you discourage, train, or restrain them away from crops? If work animals are used in production areas, can you keep them out of the beds you are harvesting? Is there a procedure to deal with the urine and the feces that is found on the property? Is it written and visible on the farm and work areas? And are you thinking about where you walk, where you drive when there's poop on the ground? Your paths may need to be separated so that when you're, the path that the animals are on is separate from the path that you're on when you're walking around on your farm so that you're not tracking it back and forth. Next slide, please. High weeds, compost, and junk piles are an excellent source of food and habitat for unwanted critters. Are you moving and cleaning up regularly, regularly to discourage them from making permanent homes? Next slide, please. Preventive action, deter and discourage. Wildlife deterrence come in many forms, scary owls, noisemakers, and the car sales guy that flips all around in the air from the wind are all uses on a farm. Does anyone else have anything that they're using specifically? Do you like the owl? Yeah, I did too. <laughs> that was interesting. Does anybody have a scarecrow? Next slide. Oh, I'm sorry. Netting and electric fences can be moved around as needed. Deer fencing is more of an investment. Some of you said you have put up the deer fencing. Next slide, please. Now that we are at the farm and we can see all the different things, all the different operations on the farm, uh, we can start to think about where there are food safety risks and how those risks can be reduced, or if there's already something here that's reducing risk. All of the animals are in pens, but at least once a day, they're allowed out and they can run freely through the farm. So there's quite a lot of poop on the ground. Is there a way to prevent that poop getting into the crops? All of the garden plots are fenced off so the animals can't get into the crops. Dana, if you're working with animals and produce on the same farm, is there a way that you can reduce the risk of cross-contamination? After touching animals or animal manure, you should change your shoes and your outer clothing and wash your hands thoroughly before moving over to work with produce. White Lock Community Farm has three hand washing stations that use municipal water and they are stocked with soap, paper towels, and trash can with a lid and a safe way to dispose of waste water. We have signage to remind people that we take food safety and hand washing very seriously. Wet your hands, add soap, and wash your hands thoroughly, front and backs of your hands, the tips in between your fingers and your lower wrist. Scrub your palms with your fingernails, which get them both cleaner. Rinse with clean water, then dry with a paper towel. Not on your clothes. Put used paper towels in the covered trash can so that they don't blow around the farm. Now you're ready to start work. If you have livestock and produce on the same farm, like the goats we have behind us, you want to make sure that you either have separate tools for working with the animals and then working with the produce, or you want to have a really good standard operating procedure for cleaning and sanitizing the equipment between uses. Kimberly, they're making compost here at Filbert Street Garden. 
Do you think it's safe? Do you think there's any risk of runoff from the compost? The compost is on the far southeast corner of the farm and it is slightly downhill from the produce. So there is no risk of runoff. What keeps you farming? I like teaching people how to put their hands in the soil, how to sustain their self by getting nu nutritious fruits and vegetables on their table. And here is the place to do it. So uh, Camilla asked a really good question. Does anyone have any SOPs they can share for smaller gardens? Um, that actually could be another webinar that we do on creating SOPs. I'm, going, yep. I'm keeping a note of the webinars that we need to do. Yep. <laughs> so a little bit, well, let's do a little bit of interaction here. Um, do you want to um, put some, speak up, unmute and speak up about what kinds of animals you have on your farm and what kinds of tools do you use to keep them away from crops? We have chickens and we have a cat. Mm -hmm. And the chickens have their run and their coop, but we do also let them out. Um, but we're, we're wanting to garden more this year. So we're gonna have to think about how to keep the chickens away from the food. So we're thinking maybe some raised planters would be good. Mm -hmm. Have you thought about now this? So this is something that we talked about at Filbert Street Garden, which is, is because the birds are running around and, and I guess the sheep are also have a fair bit of freedom. There's a lot of poop on the ground. So even if you fence off the garden or you raise the beds, so they and birds can still get into the beds, even if you raise them, I will say that you still got a lot of poop on the ground. So, um, you know, Kimberly, we had, we, we talked a bit about this. Yes. And, and um, one of the things that we thought, so at, at Filbert Street, um, we talked about maybe putting in a path for the people as opposed to, so fencing off the people from the chickens as opposed to fencing the chickens off from the, from the people. Um, so that, but that, you know, that's quite a, quite an investment that will be a lot of fencing but there's also just having a foot washing station changing shoes mm -hmm. that kind of thing um you saw the little bit in there with Kimberly changing her boots and showing all the poop on the soles of the boots Kim do you have any thoughts um just the, well we had discussed making a path at one point at Filbert Street how ways that we could minimize the walk area for the regular traffic um, and having the sheep separated as well so that they weren't all just roaming around uh, freely as much as they were so that there would be a little bit of an elimination of poop being everywhere. Um, and Ms. Rodat, are you here? Yeah, so interesting, the our young lady was talking about the chickens running around and we had did uh, started to do that at first. That was before we had section off the garden, the inner garden and from the outer garden. Um, I, actually, we got a fence around it. So like Ms. Kemmler, I was thinking, you know, um, having a separate path to the inner garden where the production is and changing your shoes once you get there. Um, the problem, um, I would say with the young lady with the chickens running around, that the chickens, if it's not fenced off, they will definitely um, get into your produce and they will uh, dig it up and make dirt baths. So that's, that's another problem. <laughs> so you won't be able to establish any plants. Mm -hmm. um, Great um, point. From That's definitely chicken. true about the dirt baths. Our chickens <laughs> love to do that. <laughs> so yeah, so like the only a solution I would have is, but what we had done just like fenced it off completely. Um, 
Kim was at the time, um, we had let the, the animals roam, roam around, the chickens and the sheep and stuff. But, you know, um, at a point we were going to take and the chickens may still run around in the outer garden, but the sheep will definitely going to be in an um, enclosed pen they'll be in the, in the goat pen so the goats they don't run around either they're in a pen a separate pen but we're going to stick those sheep over there in that pen with the goats um basically um they was rolling around trying to um the sheep was keeping down the grass and stuff and then we had some other spots where the bees was that need to be mitigated so the goats i mean the sheep was good to eat that you know weeds and stuff over there but uh, eventually they're going to be um, blocked off and they will be with the goats but they'll be we'll separate the sheep from the goats because I think the goats and the sheep are scared of each other but they'll be in a separate corner by itself if you ride back to over street you'll see the goats they are enclosed <laughs> yeah you know, so yeah but yeah you will definitely have problems with dirt baths with those chickens if you don't do something about it Thank you. Hey, Gary, are you still on? Yeah, I just hopped on. Uh, I'm between uh, Zoom meetings. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to tell us about the deer fencing that you put in at Josie Porter Farm and why you did it and what it cost? Actually, it was the first thing that we did uh, when we took over the, the, the farm. Um, we farm on municipal land. Uh, and uh, without it, uh, we would not have had a, uh, a, any crop, but um, we actually got a grant for it. It was, uh, you know, we were planting, I think in April and uh, we found out that we got the grant and, um, you know, had it set to go. So I think it was total around, was it, it was pretty pricey around 12,000, 14,000, you know, but we're, it was like six acres that we were, you know, putting deer excluder fence up at eight foot, and we used uh, cedar posts. So we had to look around for, uh, you know, uh, cedar, you know, because we didn't want to use the um, the uh, treated lumber, you know, with arsenic in it. Because uh, if you know, we we have a, well, we're not certified organic. We farm organic methods, and if you had used those posts, it would be like you had to, had to be like thirty feet away from them. So that then you know destroys a lot of usable land. Uh, mm -hmm. But um, yeah, it was eight foot high welded wire and uh, yeah, got in the nick of time or uh, the deer would have had a feast. <laughs> yeah, so we, uh, somebody's asking about electric fencing and... Yeah, I think they on the, the seed farm used electric fence um, yeah. Yeah, you know, fairly effectively. And what they did, they strung that up and also put um, peanut butter on the fence so that the deer would actually lick it and learn. Um, to be shocked. The, you know, be shocked and avoid it. So it was not eight foot high, but it, it's uh, a way to kind of like entice them and, and then entice them to avoid. Uh, yeah. It can be pretty effective too. And some farms use double or triple electric fencing. So if they jump one, they they still hit another layer of electric fencing. So, and the, the advantage, well, the advantage with electric fencing, of course, is you can move it around as needed. Yeah, and so you could and, use less and, right. but uh, yeah, six acres is quite a bit for, but it was unnecessary and you know, where, where our location is. And Radet's asking, is it painful for the deer to get a shock? I don't think it's, I honestly don't know. Uh, but I think they, they do it once and then they, they don't do it again. Yeah, they don't want it uh, to, it's, it's an avoidance thing. I mean, it's painful. If you have ever been a shock by electric fence, uh, you don't want to do it again, but right. it's, yeah, you, know, you get over it. Uh, <laughs> Valerie says it stuns yeah. them and they don't like it. Um, Valerie, so you say a woman I work with had to dig her fence a few feet into the ground to deter rabbits and groundhogs, right? That's very common too, that you need to put it below, start it below ground. My cat is really good. Yeah, we did not do that. Um, I mean, we did kind of tie it into the ground, you know, with some mm -hmm. sod stakes and that type of thing, but groundhogs did get in and, 
you know, where they got in, we could see where they got in and then we used heart, have a heart traps. And sometimes we did not have a heart, but um, right. moving them is, is another issue. So we, uh, Gary and I did a bunch of videos for the Pennsylvania Farmers Union food safety videos that are on the Pennsylvania Farmers Union website. I can track that down or find a link at some point in my cat, get that anyway. Um, that, and one of them does show, has the, the farmer at the seed farm talking about how he sets up his electric fence. So any other, I, I don't know, Kimberly, do you want to talk about the rats? The rats. <laughs> yes, we tried, we have tried so many methods. Um, I think what the challenge is, anybody who's familiar with Baltimore and Whitelock, um, the, they are doing construction on Drude Hill Park. And then St. Francis is a block up the street from us. There are also our partners. They are in the middle of construction building, uh, adding on to their building so that we'll all have offices then. So with the two areas doing construction, you can just imagine what's coming up out of the ground. So they started to burrow through and just created all these holes from the, the sewage uh, sewage on the corner and they're coming underneath of the ground. So we have tried multiple, multiple methods. We even made these little makeshift uh, Dana made uh, buckets that we put the little spindle on the top and some peanut butter on it. And hopefully we were trying to get them to fall inside of the bucket, but needless to say that didn't work. So um, we still have them there, but um, now we have gone through and covered up all of the holes, um, hopefully as humanely as possible. But we did use uh, cement to cover up a lot of the spaces that they had just burrowed through. So hopefully um, we'll pressure through this and no more rats, hopefully. But we did call 311 and ask for assistance. Uh, because it was really the whole entire area was really being infiltrated and folks is, folks that live in the houses that are on Brookfield were really having a, a lot of trouble. And it just so happened that um, the assistant to Brandon Scott actually lives on that street. So he was able to attest to what was happening. So we did get some help. So we got our fingers crossed and we're praying that they don't come back and that we're okay for a little while, at least till the summer. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, I, I enjoy your calls about, Lindsay, this crazy thing is happening at my farm. <laughs> uh, we won't talk about some of them. So uh, then actually, Sonia, could you advance the slide, please? So just a quick thing on corrective action. Um, you can see in this photograph, in this illustration, this is one of the most common corrective actions for if you find poop in the fields. Um, you flag off the area so that you're not harvesting the crop that's in that area. The, the, the size of the area that you uh, flag off or, or, or make some sort of barrier, it's really up to you. You have to decide just how, how big an area is contaminated, but you wanna flag that off so that people don't harvest it. And, and then you can think about, do, are you gonna remove the poop? Are you gonna just cover it up, bring in soil or um, some other kind of mulching material or something and cover it up. If it's a crop that touches the ground, you probably won't harvest from that crop if, if it's actually at harvest time. If it's something that's above ground and you feel like it hasn't touched the poop, maybe you will. You have, it's, it's, food safety is very much about assessing the risk on your farm and deciding just how, how likely it is that there's contamination. So what about if you notice that someone, someone has handled produce after working with animals or compost without washing their hands, without taking any precautions? Does anyone have any suggestions or ideas about what you would do if you saw that? I could call on someone. <laughs> Thelonious. Thelonious is one of our new food safety educated trainees. What what would you do if you saw some if you had someone working with you and you saw that they handle produce 
without well yeah I, I guess the the first thing i would look at is what what type of produce it was mm -hmm. like if it's something that is going to be cooked um and maybe this is maybe that's the wrong way to think but no no it's, uh, it's it is it's you're thinking about the level of risk right yeah 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 for sure i mean if it's if it's something people are going to eat raw then for sure i mean uh aside from you know giving it to the employee that didn't wash their hands <laughs> you know like they can take it with them <laughs> right you know that'd be a good way to get rid of it i guess um <laughs> like but it. Yeah, yeah. It, then immediately, you know, uh, you know, point out what they did wrong, make sure that they didn't go wash their hands, you know, um, and then clean whatever uh, that they might have touched. Um, mm -hmm. You know, if it was the harvest bin that they were handling, then I would, you know, uh, remove that harvest bin from the circulation, you know, um, and uh, yeah, just reiterate you know, the process. <clears throat> right. So, yeah, it's as Valerie said, it's a good education opportunity and let's mm -hmm. try to make them rewash the produce and wash their hands. So, it, yeah, depending on how risky that produce is, you might rewash it, you might not. If you did rewash it, you want to probably use some sanitizer in the washing water. We talked about sanitizer in our first webinar of this series. Um, but it, it's a, it's a really good opportunity for retraining somebody and for and and for you know it's perfect feedback opportunity right it happened right now and you can tell them what they did wrong and help them understand what to do right. Um, so if no water is available, make hand sanitizer available. You know, Valerie, in food safety, hand sanitizer is not considered a, a substitute for hand washing. So it, we really, really encourage people to set up some kind of hand washing set up, um, facility on their farm. And, it, and it, at Whitelock, you know, they've got just water coolers with a bucket to catch the water, uh, soap, paper towels, and a trash can. It doesn't have to be fancy. So, um, and, and we've, we've been encouraged to do a lot, use a lot of hand sanitizer in the past year because of COVID, but COVID is not a foodborne illness. Um, with, with food, you really want to make sure that your hands are washed well. What are some resources for sanitizing your washing water for produce? Well, that we eat that. <laughs> you mean, um, Deborah, are you asking specifically what kinds of sanitizers you can use? If you are, there's um, particular kinds of bleach, not every kind of chlorine bleach. You have to make sure it's labeled for use in uh, washing produce. Um, there's uh, different kinds of parasitic acid products. Sanidate is one, Tsunami is another. Uh, there are a number of others that I'm not thinking of off the top of my head. Parasitic acid uh, products are usually uh, acceptable. Uh, they're usually approved for organic farming. Um, again, you have to make sure that whatever you're using is labeled for the use of washing produce and you follow the directions very carefully and the label of the product. So you're not using too much or too little. Very often people use too much. Yes, I will write those in the chat. Um, we're gonna take a break actually. Well, hang on. There's, yeah, we're gonna take a break now. So I'll write some things in the chat, but I, we can also give you the link to the webinar that we did that talked about sanitizing, which is an hour and a half that you can watch <laughs> on that. But I, I can also give you, uh, in our toolkit we have, um, different kinds of information about sanitizers. So Aaliyah will be sending a follow-up email with links to our toolkit. Um, I'm assuming bird droppings from overflying fox is included in contamination. Yeah, so this, we're gonna, I'm gonna talk a bit about doing pre-harvest risk assessments towards the end. And that's when you're looking for that kind of thing. Obviously you can't prevent birds from flying over and you can't prevent them from pooping. So you, you reduce risk. Sanidate 5.0, thank you, Kimberly. So uh, next slide. Sonia, are you still there? Yeah, I advanced it to no pets in the packing area. Does it, I think. Oh, that's it, that's it, I'm sorry. Just a lag. Yeah, I think there's a lag. Uh, so we're gonna leave you with this image. This is why you don't have pets in the packing area. <laughs> 
I have been to packing areas with the dogs are jumping all over and the, and the cats are sleeping and things and the, and you really you just you might have them outside a little bit more but you really don't want to have them in the area where you've got produce and packing materials stored so okay so let's take a five minute break uh, I, I have put the link to our survey in the chat we really need you to fill out this survey we get funding from the USDA um, uh, National Institute for Food and Agriculture. This is how we can provide our services for free. And so filling out that survey helps us to prove that we're doing something useful, hopefully, and you can let us know if what we're doing is working for you as well so we can improve. So let's take five minutes. Uh, we'll be back at 4.08 with uh, Holly Kaiser from Bloom. Holly, and we're gonna hear now from Holly Kaiser. Um, again, please do fill out our survey. I'm, while well, Holly's talking, I'm gonna be finding some things on use of sanitizers that I'll put some links to. But as I said, um, we will be sending out a link to our toolkit that has some information on there and then links to other. There's a lot of information out there about how to use sanitizer. It gets a little confusing. So I'm trying to get you stuff that is to the point. So Holly, are you ready? And Sonia, well, you, you don't need Sonia for this. I believe I am. Hello, everyone. I am, I don't know, I'm having trouble with my slide. Oh, there it is. I am Holly Kaiser. I am a multi-generational farmer located here in Carroll County on my husband's family farm. Um, about 170 acres, we have about 30 head of cattle and soon to have some 4-H piggies in about another month or so. We have used biosolids on our farm for about 20 plus years in our crop program. Anybody who has any questions of what biosolids are, they are a nutrient-rich organic material resulting from the treatment of domestic sewage in a wastewater treatment facility. So we are the people side of the poo, of what to do with the poo. <laughs> they are a beneficial resource containing essential plant nutrients, organic matter, as a recycled fertilizer and soil amendment. There is a lot of value in biosolids. There's lots of organic matter, energy, beneficial microbes, macro and micronutrients, and a lot of help with drought resistance. I am the ag representative for Bloom. Um, it is a biosolid with a slow release fertilizer, rich in organic matter, ideal for improving water holding capacity and overall soil structure. It's an excellent source of both macro and micronutrients, essential in improving plant vigor. There are some things that make Bloom special when it comes to biosolids, and that is because of our anaerobic digestion and thermohydrolysis. This is where that happens here at Blue Plains Advanced Wastewater Treatment Facility, or as they like to call the Resource and Recovery Program. Um, this is where this grade A exceptional quality biosolid happens. It um, goes through a lot of stages of screening, and then it is put into a high heat and pressure to kill all those pathogens, um, basically a giant pressure cooker. And it goes then into anaerobic digestion to repopulate those beneficial microbes. And then you have bloom. Where would you like to use bloom um, it, or where, why would you use it is a nutrient rich soil conditioner. It's an excellent source of organic matter. It provides- Holly I'm, Holly, I'm sorry to interrupt, but someone's saying the shared screen is only showing up partially. Okay, Sonia, Sonia's, okay. I'm sorry, Holly, carry on. Sonia's uh, handling it. Okay, I would say it's full on mine. Is it not on yours? It looks like it may be just, that one person's problem. Um, screen. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> All right. 
So we'll go back to why use Bloom, again, the nutrient-rich soil conditioner, excellent source of organic matter, providing slow release nitrogen, lots of iron for darker and greener leaves. It's weed and seed free. It is very cost effective, depending on your proximity to the plant, around four to $6 a ton delivered and minimal odor because it does go through the digesters. It has more of a mulchy earthy smell. Um, last year, absolutely no smell complaints whatsoever. Here is our nutrient analysis for Bloom, um, your macro micro um, nutrients. Big thing there is we are the Mac Daddy of organic matter, about 360 pounds per ton. Uses for Bloom, corn, hay, um, other grasses, pasture and such, soybeans, vegetables, grapevines, trees, flowers, hops, and anything really much, much more. All right, I'm gonna show you guys some bloom in action over the last year. This is a turf and soybean farm in Montgomery County. Um, we had some bloom delivered there. This is after an application of about 10 tons to the acre using a turf tiger. This is bloom at an ag field that I believe was going in Frederick County that was going to into um, soybean crop. This is some corn from Charles County. He calls it his prize winning corn even after the terrible monsoon season in that area. Then we take you to the drought area of Carroll County. Maryland was all over the place this year weather-wise. Um, this is that same field there in Carroll County. And even with the terrible drought conditions with the water holding capacity that Bloom offers, they stayed super green and lush the whole season. And he actually had a very good yield. This is a mushroom, um, kind of a new avenue that Bloom has gotten into this year. Uh, they really like it because it is sterile and weed and seed free. Great to get into that market. This is one of our clients farming for hunger who do a great deal with the Maryland Food Bank. Um, really great program. This is some of their raised beds they used with Bloom. Some of his cabbage crop, which he was super proud of, did really well with the Bloom. Nice, green, large, healthy plants. Um, some of the reasons that we have success is getting balanced with Bloom, building that great solid soil foundation, increasing the organic matter, which helps your soil fertility. Obviously the more, <laughs> I'm sorry, did somebody say something? Do you have a question? Okay. Um, getting that soil fertility, being happy, healthy, which makes your crop happy and healthy. Also, the more fertile your soil is, it's decreasing the additional need of nutrients. These are a few of the Maryland farmers that are using um, Bloom for the past year or two. A big one there, again, is Farming for Hunger, a nonprofit, doing really great things for the Maryland Food Bank. Um, like we said, we are all about the resource and recovery and saying that there is no such thing as waste and only wasted resources. And that's all for me. I'd like to thank Future Harvest for having me. And here are our handles on social media. My information, if you have any um, inquiries about farm stuff, our farm page there at bloomsoil.com farms. Any questions about spreading and applications, we are having a Bloom Spreader webinar on March 4th. Do you believe my coworker is also going to pop that link in the chat for you? Thank you. Chris, uh, Lindsay, are you ready to unmute yourself? Thanks. 
I'm chatting away and I'm muted. Okay, so the, I was just going to say, if we could take a couple of minutes to answer questions that are in the chat about Bloom, particularly about heavy metals. Oh, Francesca's answering in the chat. Um, okay. Oh, there too. I'd also like to say um, one of the nice things also about Bloom is because DC is not an industrial based city, there are a lot less metal issues and and our guaranteed analysis, all that's on there as well. Thank you. I'm, I've been fascinated with human you for a long time and I'm excited to hear that there are next generation biosolids that um, really uh, responsible people are working on to let's face it, human waste is the largest source of something good and bad. So we need, really need to figure out how to use it well. All right, so let's talk about raw manure and compost. Hold on one second. Just gonna get to my other slides. So yeah, along with the many benefits for soil health and plant nutrition and so on, raw manure and incompletely composted manure, which I'm gonna talk about, can also be a source of human pathogens. And several of the largest outbreaks of foodborne illness from fresh produce have been traced back to animal manure, animal manure in the water, animal manure on equipment. Um, so it is very real. And yes, those outbreaks tend to be in the larger food industry, larger food aggregation of food. That, that's what makes them very widespread outbreaks. <clears throat> but we don't really know if there are outbreaks on, in smaller scale farming because there aren't as many people, they tend not to get reported. So we can't assume that because we're on small farms that there aren't pathogens and that they don't make people sick. So we just have to be aware and figure out how to reduce risks. Next slide. So, and actually let's go to the next slide. What does the FDA define as raw manure? Next slide. So there is obviously actual manure, the raw poop, that animals and humans poop. And um, when we're talking about urban farms, human poop is actually a little bit more of an issue. Uh, we won't go into that in detail. And then there's incompletely composted manure. Next slide. You know what, I need to move this over so I can see. Next slide, please, Sandra. So incomplete is, means manure that's composted using a passive or what they consider a non-scientific method. So like my compost, you pile it up, uh, you, 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 I get manure from my uh, neighbor across the street who has chickens and I put it into my compost pile with all my vegetative, vegetative waste. And I, I just let, it's my lasagna method. I let time, rain and sunlight do the work. That is a non-scientific method. Next slide. If the compost is only made from vegetative materials, it's considered lower risk. Next slide. However, if you've got a lot of animals in there pooping, then you have animal poop in your manure. So it's, it's lower risk, I guess, than using large quantities of cow or horse or chicken or rabbit manure, but it's still something to think about. Next slide. So if manure is composted using a valid scientific method, such as um, what is the, the treat, treatments that are considered valid under the National Organic Program requirements. Um, so you've got establishing an initial carbon to nitrogen ratio, maintaining temperatures over a period of time, um, turning the material and so on. This kind of treatment is considered scientifically valid. There are other kinds of much more controlled treatments that are typically done in commercial facilities, heat drying, anaerobic. Well, I guess there are some farms now with anaerobic digesters um, and aerobic digesters. But if it's, if it's a, a method where you're actually keeping records of the process, then typically you could say it's a scientifically valid method and you, have, you could have a you could have a good argument to an inspector or an auditor. Next slide. So if it's using a scientifically valid method, then the compost is considered low risk. Now, if, you are, if you're 
subject to the produce safety rule, and uh, it didn't seem like a lot of you were when we asked that question in the beginning, but if you are, then you really do have to pay attention to whether or not your compost is, um, de is, is, is developed, created using a scientific method. If you're not subject to the produce safety rule, if you're not trying to be GAP certified or food safety certified, then there are no requirements that you have to follow, but it's still something to consider. So anyway, if the compost is considered low risk, then you can side dress at any time. And then if you are subject to the rule, if you have to comply with the produce safety rule, or if you want to get GAP certified or organic certification, as those of you who are organic certified know, you have to keep records that showing that the manure is composted using a specific scientific method. And if you're buying compost from, an, from a vendor, then you need to request a certificate of assurance from that vendor that the product was properly treated, handled, transported, and stored so that it didn't get recontaminated during transportation and storage. Next slide. If you do use raw manure, and there's no reason not to use raw manure or incompletely composted manure, next slide, you need to think about the timing of your application to reduce risk. So the produce safety rule at, that, at this point doesn't, doesn't have a ruling on um, the time interval from planting to harvesting when you're using raw manure, but they recommend that we use the National Organic Program regulation, which is you apply and work into the soil no less than two weeks before planting and at least 120 days before harvest if the crop touches the ground or 90 days before harvest where it doesn't touch the ground. And here, I live in Pennsylvania and here um, a lot of crop farmers, both field crop farmers and especially produce farmers, are, they apply manure after the growing season. So that leaves plenty of time for the manure to be exposed to the elements and allow any of the pathogens to die off before the next season. Next slide. So you also want to think about the method you use for spreading the manure and if it poses any risk to crops nearby. So if you're, if you're using raw manure, if you're using incompletely composted manure, are you spreading, is it wet? or is it dry? Are you spreading it by hand, which is a little safer? Of course, it's on a small farm, you're more likely to spread it by hand. On a larger farm, usually they're using sprayers or some other mechanical um, process for spreading it. You need to remember to apply the raw manure near crops. Uh, if you're applying the crops, sorry, if you're applying the manure near crops that are subject to that 120 day, 90 day restriction, you gotta make sure that you're not getting it on the crops nearby. Is your neighbor spraying raw manure? And this happens, I see this a lot in um, Southeastern Pennsylvania. There are manure spreaders out there, especially at the end of the season, not even, not at the end of the, the, at the end of the field crop season, not at the end of the fresh produce season. So if your neighbor is spreading it, or if you are spreading it on a, on a close by field to your, crops, then you really have to think things through. What's the wind doing that day and so on? Do you need to talk to your neighbor about when and where they apply their raw manure close to your crops? And you really do not want to side dress produce with raw manure because you can't be sure that it's going to be safe. Next slide. So this is uh, to the question that someone asked earlier, if you are using livestock to clean up harvested fields, you have to think in terms of that raw manure interval. So uh, again, if you, you want to think about it's 120 days from planting to harvesting if it touches the ground, if the crop touches the ground and 90 days if it doesn't touch the ground. So again, if you're doing this at the end of the season and you have the whole winter, um, then you should be fine. Next slide. We can't say this too much. Are you washing your hands after, right after working with manure or compost? Is it easy? Do you make it easy for people to find a place to wash their hands? Next slide. And then where is the raw manure or composting manure stored? Is, it, is there any risk from runoff into your farm lanes or into the farmyard or into the crops? And um, 
you can see in these photos, the one has um, actually it's I believe horse bedding. This is on an Amish farm where they have a lot of horses and mules. So it's uphill from the crop. So when it rains, is that raw manure leaching into the greens? And then in the other slide, I see this quite often that manure is piled up next to the farm lane. And if it's slightly uphill and it rains, you're gonna get leaching onto the farm lane and you're driving and walking through it. So you need to think these things through, put it on the other side of the farm lane where it's downhill, as long as that's not right next to the crops. Uh, whenever I do a risk assessment on farms, we have a lot of conversations about these little details that come up. Sorry, Sonia, I'm talking more than you think I'm going to. Next slide. Is there any risk of walking or driving through the raw manure? I just talked about that. But also, are you sharing, just as with animals, are you sharing equipment? So uh, are you hauling manure and produce using the same equipment? And if you are, are you cleaning and sanitizing that equipment in between? There is an outbreak with the cantaloupes that you may have heard about in 2010, where they were hauling cantaloupes um, in, in a vehicle that was also used to haul manure and they weren't cleaning it thoroughly enough. And that killed 32 people. So you need to think about these things. Are you checking the wheels or feet and cleaning them before you work with produce? All right, so let's think about risk reduction. Um, I'm particularly fond of this illustration from Wild Farm Alliance, where um, they've really thought about all the different things that you could put in place to reduce risk. So on, on Ms. Rodette's operation at Filbert Street Garden, they have fencing around the produce to stop the birds from going in there. And there's still some thinking to be done about, as she spoke about how to reduce people walking the poop in there, but there is already fencing and the manure is downhill and on the far corner of the property. So there's no potential there for runoff. So there are things that are already in place and actually the whole farm has a really a deer fence around it. It's tall enough to be a deer fence. So um, sometimes you already have things there. So in this play, in, in this illustration, there are ditches, there are windbreaks, there are berms, there are vegetative buffers or grass buffers. Um, there's predator habitat. The predators are there to um, keep down the, the kinds of critters that actually eat your crops. They've got fencing for livestock. They've got riparian barriers to help keep the water clean. And they're also thinking about the crop placement. I don't know how easily you can see this, but up in the top left-hand corner, there are compost windrows, piles of compost. Then there's a windbreak. And then the crop that's right below that is not a crop that's typically eaten raw. So there's, there's, there's the windbreak and the crop not typically eaten raw as buffers between the compost and the leafy greens below it. So they've thought through, if this was an actual farm, they've thought through how to put buffers in to prevent wind drift or leaching into the crops that are most sensitive. Um, I was on a farm years ago where they had a drive lane that went to the crop field that went right through a cow paddock. And um, they were, they had leafy greens in that field. So they were driving and everyone was walking through the cow paddock to get to the leafy greens. So what we discussed was switching things around so the potatoes were in that field or, or I mean, obviously they were doing crop rotation. So different kinds of crops that were low risk and putting the high risk crops in a different part of the farm where they weren't um, creating that kind of potential for cross contamination. Next slide. So again, Wild Farm Alliance, um, they and their partners are the CAF, which is, oh, I can't remember what CAF stands for. California Alliance for Family Farms. They created some really great resources. And I, I encourage you, if you want to think about cons how conservation and ecological farming practices can actually help to reduce risk of, of contamination from pathogens, they've got some really good resources. Um, so here there are different uh, conservation practices. And then what that actually 
does to reduce risk. So grass waterways, riparian buffers, wetlands actually um, reduce pathogen, nutrient and pesticide filtration. And they stabilize soil and riverbanks. They have groundwater, it provides groundwater recharge, so it's cleaning the groundwater, water purification, flood control, more available water. So these, these different things actually, you can be using great conservation and ecological practices that are also helping to reduce risk in terms of food safety. So that it's really important to understand that, um, that, you, that by having a, a, a healthy microbiome on your farm, you're actually creating competition for pathogens. Uh, actually, next slide, which is pretty much saying that. So soil rich and microbial diversity will increase competition with human and plant pathogens and may help to reduce pathogens in the farm environment. So we are all at Future Harvest and Chesapeake Harvest, we're all about soil health as are many other sustainable farming organizations and, and trainers and educators these days. And soil health can actually help with food safety as well. Next slide. Now, if, uh, there, if you have to um, comply with the produce safety rule or um, if you wanna get GAP certification, there are records that you have to keep. And the GAP certification or good agricultural practices certification, this is a voluntary certification you would get because a buyer requires it, not because the law requires it. And typically in, in the different kinds of GAP standards and certifications you can get, they will require records for application of raw manure or incompletely composted manure. And so this is an example of a soil amendment application log. Um, but keeping information like this can also help you to analyze the benefit for crop health and crop yield from year to year. So it's actually quite a useful business development tool as well. I have various different versions of this. Uh, this is probably the simplest one that I have. But uh, when I, we also work with people to develop, to write food safety plans. We did that with Thelonious, who spoke earlier, and quite a lot of other farmers in the region. And um, we have, I have lots of resources, lots of different logs and templates and resources and fact sheets and example SOPs and all kinds of things that um, we use when we're working with someone to help them write a food safety plan or just to come up with a series of SOPs for their farm, which we can also do for you, with you, with you, not for you. Next slide. So here's an example of a standard operating procedure. We, we uh, talked about that, uh, uh, Kimberly talked about that earlier. This is a farm that I work with, Earth Spring Farm in Carlisle, PA, and um, Mike at Earth Spring Farm loves writing SOPs. Uh, so this is one that he created for his chicken feeding and egg collection process. And he is actually using a foot bath on his farm using, um, and he's using Sanidate, which is a periacetic acid based sanitizer. Um, so basically an SOP, it's a written procedure that just makes it easier. It make it, you write down your process so that you can train your farm crew on that process, any new people starting work or any new people volunteering on the farm. It's really great to write things down. They don't have to be really complicated. Um, I think uh, you probably went by too fast, but Dicot Farm has a really nice, simple, straightforward SOP that they have in their packing shed for how to, how to use the four steps for cleaning and sanitizing. You want to keep them as simple as possible. And if you have a farm crew, you want to in, engage them in writing them with you because they're, if they're the ones doing the work, they're the ones who know how to do it in the most efficient and practical fashion. Next slide. And um, this is something that <clears throat> I really recommend, even if you don't, you're not getting GAP certified, even if you don't have to comply with the produce safety rule, a pre-harvest risk assessment, I think is actually really good best practice. So you do need to do this if you wanna pass a GAP audit. Uh, you have to have a pre-harvest risk assessment and you have to monitor for animals in the fields. This is actually a combined animal monitoring and pre-harvest risk assessment log instead of having two different logs. This is one combined. 
And um, it's a, it's, so you're assessing the risks before you actually harvest. You're probably already out there looking at the crop before you harvest it anyway. So you just take a clipboard with you or if you, you can also do it remotely and work out how to have it on your phone um, or your uh, tablet. <coughs> actually it'd be good if anybody is using any kind of um, record key online or any software for keeping records, um, please share that with everyone in the chat. It's not actually a great area of expertise for me, but um, please, please share. Uh, so even if you don't have to keep records, this is one of the logs I recommend, as I said, as, as best practice. And it's a really great teaching tool for farm crew. It helps them to think about what they need to look for when they're out in the field while they're harvesting as well as pre-harvest. So that is all the slides I have today. Let's go to the last slide. Um, as I said, uh, well, actually I didn't say, and I apologize, Nia, this, I did not say that this particular webinar is a partnership between Future Harvest and Chesapeake Harvest, which is a project of the Eastern Economic Development Corporation. I think this might be the last, <clears throat> the last event we have to um, and in our in our joint project, Chesapeake Harvest is is going on for another two years. We were going to be training in a, a two more cohorts of community-based food safety educators, and we, we we will be providing more food safety webinars. Uh, I took down some ideas for tutorials. One of them creating SOPs. One of them a tutorial on on whether or not you are you have to comply with the produce safety rule. I think people need that more information. And we, we've, we've done it before, but I think it helps to do it in different ways and different formats. And we will provide one-on-one -on -one assistance for farmers. So we can, as I said earlier, we can come and do an on-farm risk assessment with you. We'll be bringing educator trainees with us. So it's a great training opportunity for them. You can also invite your friends and neighbors to attend. So they get an idea of what it is to do an on-farm risk assessment. We can work with you to write standard operating procedures and food safety plans. We can help you get ready for a gap audit. Um, we are funded to do that for free <coughs> for the next year and a half. So it's a good opportunity. Um, we do, other than the on-farm risk assessment, we can do most of this remotely. So it doesn't really matter where you are, as long as you can get on Zoom, we can work with you. So you can get in contact with um, Aliyah or me. I'm going to put our email addresses in the chat. If you're interested in any of these things. Uh, Kimberly, is there anything I have forgotten to say? Uh, did we ask everybody to complete the survey? No, let's put the survey back in there again, too. What did I do with it? <laughs> Please fill out the survey. Ah. Sonia, do you have the link to the survey? I lost it. Yep. Okay. So we've got, we, we've finished 20 minutes early. How the heck did we do that? It seemed like there was a lot of information. Um, are there any thoughts or questions, ideas, farm hacks that you have to share? For anybody who's uh, technically inclined or likes to do mechanical stuff, um, we were talking about the scarecrows and owls and CDs to help scare away uh, livestock. I know somebody who's installing uh, like a rotating system on the owl's head so that whenever something comes up, it's motion activated and it, uh, and it moves and it, it seems to be pretty effective. <laughs> I'm not digitally, like I'm not inclined for mechanical work, but that can be a fun thing for people who know how to do that. That would be great. So Valerie, I like the idea of having a presentation for small community gardens and perhaps personal gardens in the city. Huh. You mean Valerie specifically on food safety? You can unmute and talk to us if you like. Yes, can you hear me? My yeah. mic sometimes acts up. Yeah, I since um, I'm a Baltimore City Master Gardener mm -hmm. and we do a lot with city gardens and there's so much contamination in the city and I, people are always having questions about it. Hmm. So I think having some sort of presentation that focuses on smaller areas 
um, and making it available for the consumer, I think would be really helpful because Baltimore does have a lot of issues. I mean, when you're talking about the animals and the rats and the cats, <laughs> things right. like that. And we actually, I live in Charles Village, which is downtown. We have chickens on in my back alley. Uh -huh. um, we are allowed to have a certain amount of livestock in the city. So I think all of that would be, a, it would be really interesting. I think helpful to have it for the consumer as opposed to someone who is looking at production farming. Mm -hmm. Yeah, is that something that Future Harvest would do? I don't really know. I'm, I'm oh, actually I'm, in the- I'm asking, I'm asking me if, if- Okay. Yeah. Um, I'll unmute, I just wanted to- but That's a great, great suggestion though. We, we, we'll have to think about that one. It, I know that Future Harvest tends to try to focus on people who are either doing commercial farming um, or it, or nonprofit farming that has like a pretty significant farm component to the nonprofit. Um, usually Extension has the Master Gardeners program that does more like home garden kind of pieces, but it doesn't mean that there couldn't be a session we could collaborate on for something like this. So um, uh, it's worth yeah. reaching out to the Extension people in Baltimore and maybe we could see if there's a way to work together for a session like that. Uh, perhaps Neath over there at the extension office. Uh -huh. Yep. And exactly. then get together with the Master Gardeners Community Garden mm -hmm. Committee and kind of collaborate. I think that would be, because I don't really, I've been doing this for a lot of years and there's nothing that's been offered that's that has been focused on this. Mm. On food safety. Yeah, I mean, uh, Neath, this could well, be- from the gardening perspective. That's right. really what it is, yeah. You mean food safety in the garden? Is that what you're saying? Right. It's usually after it's harvested. Right. Yes. Yes. Once you, once it's more food handling rather than gardening. Correct. Yeah, there could be something that our our educator cohort, you know, we could um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. do uh, do something there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if there's a need for it, we should definitely find a way. Mm -hmm. So that sounds sounds yeah. good. Well, thank you. Sure. Um, Joe, great question. I'd like to know what to do with human poop in a small farm. Can you tell us exactly what your human poop issue is? Hi. Hello, everyone. Hi. Uh, yes, thank you so much. Yes, my question is, um, especially when using compost toilets, uh, um, I have like too much uh, information that I, I like to. I would like to know what to do with with it after I, you know, take the bucket out and put it somewhere, and and just what is safe to what is um, yeah safe to That's do. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which I've heard just uh, different opinions, and we with. Um, P2, so I wanted to get um, one <laughs> point of view uh, from all of you, <laughs> a lot of points of view. Um, okay, uh, Wesley Cornell has the humanyourhandbook.com there I have to check that out. Um, so does anyone on the team want to field this question before I do? So I've heard that you should let it sit for at least a year. Um, before even doing anything else with it. So some people will um, take the manure, put it in maybe like if their buckets fill, they'll put it in another larger bucket and let it sit for at least a year. Um, and then after that, I'm not sure exactly what they do. Um, I just know it has to like cure because it's out of human pathogens and um, you know, it's a serious public health concern. It's even more so than other animals because we easily transmit um, pathogens to each other. So. I know in California, I visited a couple of farms out there that did do that um, and they had tanks that they used. So they would have their five gallon buckets, move that to a bigger tank and that that's it for at least a year. Then after that, I don't remember exactly what they do, but a lot of permaculture locations will use it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Alani, do you have you had any experience with composting toilets? Not, not to the level of knowing uh, when 
it's appropriate to use it. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> yeah. So um, I could imagine if you've got a composting toilet that, that is being used a lot, you could end up with a whole lot of poo manure that you have to store somewhere for a year. So my suggestion, well, first of all, you want to think about where is it situated and is there any possibility if there's a spill that it could get into crops that people are eating. So um, if you can't move the composting toilet, can you re rearrange so that the crops that are around it or the plants that are around it are not edible and also use it on non-edible. So if you're growing flowers, um, if you're growing ornamental pumpkins or squash, you could use it on those crops rather than the crops that people eat. Mm -hmm. um, and it can, uh, yeah, I mean, I, as, as um, Crystal said, there are a lot more issues with human manure than there are with animal, that, well, frequently than there are with animal manure. So you have to be a bit more careful. Does it, Joe, does that make any sense? Is that something you could do is use it on crops that are not eaten? Uh, yeah, yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. Mm -hmm. and, like keep it, and for a year and I you could do uh, that too for a year yeah I could do that yeah and you could also get it tested like keep it for a year and then get it tested to see if it's safe that's another possibility um the other kind of poop that you get on urban farms it, human poop that you get on urban farms can be just people pooping and and this is going to happen on rural farms too it's something that um <laughs> well, let's face it, people will poop in the woods. So uh, you want them to poop in the woods, not in the field. But if you really just treat it the way you would poop from wildlife, if you find it, so you need to do your risk assessment, like how, how, what is it contaminated? Um, what do I need to flag off? Can I bury it? Can I dispose of it? Uh, do I need to dispose of the plants if it got onto plants? So it's it, when I when I think about humans who are pooping in on urban farms and wild, and rural farms, I think of them as wildlife. And how do you handle contamination from pee or poop from wildlife? Obviously, you can't always tell if the wildlife has peed, but you can usually tell if a human has. <laughs> Any other questions? This is great that we have some time for this kind of thing. Questions or ideas or thoughts. Miss Rydette, is there anything that you feel like you've learned that you're going to do differently? And we are going to keep working with you as well. Is there anything else you'd like to learn from us? I hate to put you on the spot, but I'm doing it anyway. Because you had some great ideas earlier. Oh, I don't know if she heard me. I think people might be done. <laughs> Thank you for hanging out with us for an hour and 50 minutes. Thank you to Ms. Rodette for having us on the on uh, Filbert Street Community Garden. That was a great day for us. And we got some great footage. We have more footage we're probably going to play, play with. Um, this, we have recorded this webinar and we'll be sending an email. Aaliyah will be sending an email out with a link to the recording and once we get all these videos up in our YouTube channel, we will be sending you a link to that as well. And again, let us know if you would like to have us help you give you some one on one assistance with food safety. Um, I think that's it. Kimberly, have I forgotten anything? I think so. <laughs> I think we covered it all. I think we did. All right, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank if you. If anything later, just hit us on the email. Yep. Bye.